नमस्कार मैं हूं दिबांग वेलकम टू सदन राइजिंग समिट एंड वी हैव अ वेरी स्पेशल गेस्ट रामोन राइडू थैंक यू आई हैव इंटरव्यूड योर फादर एम नाउ लकी एनफ टू इंटरव्यू यू टेल मी द बिग न्यूज इज द ब्रेकिंग न्यूज एवरीवेयर इज दिस हुक्स कॉल्स टू ऑल द एयरलाइंस व्हाट हैव यू डन अबाउट इट व्हाट आर यू प्लानिंग टू डू अबाउट इट इट्स अ वेरी सीरियस मैटर i know the hoax calls have been happening for the past 8 to 9 days and uh, quite frequently and we have been seeing it in the news also but right from the first day itself when these hoax calls started our civil aviation ministry in concurrence with the home affairs ministry and ministry of it who are the nodal ministries uh, addressing this issue and in fact external affairs also we have been sitting on top of the situation we were trying to assess it what exactly is happening and one thing we have done is uh, from our side ministry of civil aviation we have little bit uh, dug deeper into the legislation that we already had so that what best can we do to uh, make this event stop so one thing we felt was that if we catch hold of a person who is behind these kind of acts then what do we do with him so one thing we thought was let us change the legislation a little bit especially the aircraft security rules so that we can put him in the no fly list so that is one for a beginning and second we have a suaska act which is uh, uh, the unlawful activities regarding civil aviation and we when we saw the act uh, it was covering these kind of offenses when they were on in flight so we wanted to extend it to on ground flight and near uh, at airport flights also so that is another legislation that we are proposing and it is getting vetted by other ministerial consultations also so i feel that these two are going to act as a deterrent when you try to find out the person who is behind this and other than that all the law enforcement agencies who are in this uh, department let it be the local police or let it be the home affairs the intelligence the ministry of it they are all kind of taking serious cognizance of this issue and we are keeping the situation very dynamic day to do activities we are thoroughly following up and we are trying to improvise on the kind of uh, response system that we have we are learning on the way and when we see that and one thing that i want to uh, tell you one fact that i want to tell you is that all these calls that have been made are hoax calls so we are trying to see what kind of pattern emerges and what kind of responsive system we can have with two considerations one is to reduce the inconvenience of the passengers and reduce the inconvenience that the aircrafts or the uh, airports are facing so we are keeping a very dynamic view on this situation and we are doing what best it is and even the prime minister is encouraging us to uh, handle this situation in a very good way do we have any clue on who's making these calls where are they making these calls I mean, from this, why are they making these yeah, calls this has been thoroughly asked and media talks about some kind of conspiracy but as a minister i would not like to comment on it unless we investigate thoroughly and the law enforcement agencies themselves come up with an idea saying that this is what has exactly happened so until we have the investigation finished a person caught or uh, some organization if it is behind this until that happens i don't want to comment on this now are you also going through the laws in other countries for such hoax calls are you aware of them are you working yes, on that yes absolutely also? that is why i said the ministry of external affairs is also involved because some of the international airlines are also facing these kind of threats one thing i want to ensure is that we always keep in the ministry of civil aviation we always keep the safety and security of the passengers the topmost priority no matter how many times we see that these are hoax calls even if our intuition says that 99.99% of it this is a hoax call we have to follow the protocol that is something which we don't want to miss so we have enhanced the security systems we have enhanced the surveillance measures everything at the airports double because there is a festive season happening and we have seen repeated these uh, calls also happening so one thing is that we have improved the security at the airports and for that we are taking in uh, uh, the support of all the other uh, countries also we are trying to see how best because these uh, some of the times uh, they are putting these uh, threats on twitter and uh, most of the times when you follow the ip address they come from some other countries they can be masked also through vpn and everything so it is important for us to talk to other countries also in these kind of uh, situations are you happy that the government doesn't own any airlines also not because of these hoax ho calls i'm not talking about that otherwise also i mean to be honest we still have one airlines with us it is alliance air we have 20 aircrafts with us atr still running and we are doing a very good job of running them in the northeast areas where connectivity is very very important but 
it's, it's usually the perception that we have uh, sold the Air India so we don't have any airlines and I'm quite okay with that idea because as a regulator I feel our concentration should be more on the policy making. If you are able to concentrate on the policy making, bring in right regulations because civil aviation we have seen stupendous amount of growth in the last 10 years especially more than 10% in some cases in some years. So with that kind of growth already happening and so many private players already functioning in the industry, I think our concentration should be more on how do you regulate it in a better way, how do you make the policy making much more efficient, much more robust so that your goals, ultimate goals can be achieved. Okay. One thing that has been seen is that whenever there's a crisis situation, there was a cyclone recently, cartelization happens and the secret prices really grow up double it becomes. Are you doing something about it? Are you aware about it? In fact, I was bombarded by these questions in the Lok Sabha sessions I was, uh, uh, that have concluded in July. And uh, I kind of agree to your point to one extent where it is that when there is a festive season, when there is an increase in demand or when there is some kind of alarming situation or some kind of calamity, then you generally see that the fares go up. That is again linking to the demand of the situation. And in times of these, we have tried to sensitize the airlines and we issue a circular also whenever there is a calamity, we issue a circular to the airlines saying that this is a time of a natural calamity. So let us be all sensitive of the issue and let us not raise the prices. That is something which we usually do. And when it comes to the festive season, it is more a demand driven market, civil aviation industry, uh, especially the airfares industry. So uh, there also we are trying to speak with the airlines in a very positive and proactive manner, kind of giving them a scenario of the uh, middle class passenger that is aspirational today and wants to travel through air. So we, to, to kind of give that connectivity to the common man, I think we are trying to do our bit according to the law because law doesn't permit us to uh, put a cap on the airfares uh, uh, for the government. So we are utilizing the, the relation that we have with the airlines, we are sensitizing them for the situation and I can say that once we started doing it in the uh, months of July and August and we have observed that the compared to the previous years, we haven't seen so much escalation in air airfares this uh, festive season. In a uh, cyclone kind of situation, do you think you need to do more than just a circular? Uh, maybe have a law a that in a disaster situation, disaster. in that emergency situation, you don't raise, at least don't raise the prices, no? No, definitely, definitely. It's not just about uh, issuing the circular. We ensure that the prices are also not raised. So it is taking to the logical conclusion also and we ensure every time there is a natural calamity and even the airlines understand that position and they also cooperate. So it is taking to a logical conclusion and ensuring that the prices don't increase rather than just saying that we are releasing a circular. Despite Uran, uh, air travel is still a luxury. Uh, what is the government doing to make it accessible to the middle class, rural middle class? Uh, if you would have said this statement 10 years back, I would have agreed. But I think things have changed a lot after especially the uh, launching of Udan scheme. And we have successfully completed eight years of Udan scheme. Udan is the Ode Desh Ka Aam Nagrik scheme, which has been a brainchild of a Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji. And his whole idea was Hawaii Chappal Se Hawaii Jahaj Ka Safar. He wanted to ensure that India is becoming more and more aspirational and as people are getting aspirational, they want to travel through the air itself. And how better, how should the government assist in meeting those aspirations and that is how Udan came into play. Udan, through Udan, we have connected the unserved and underserved airports of the country and you would know that 74 airports in 2014, we have increased the number of airports to 157. No country in the globe has been able to achieve this kind of success in civil aviation. And we have increased the number of airports and we have took the airport infrastructure to the remotest parts of the country. And once we have done that, the challenge for us was to how do we connect them? Because uh, like I said, it's market driven industry. People, uh, the airlines wouldn't go where people were not uh, uh, willing to pay that much money or they wouldn't get the feasibility. So Udan ensured that the viability gap funding was given the unconnected airports or underserved airports, they were all connected through the Udan. And one best example that I can give is the Darbanga airport. In 2020, before 2020, Darbanga was not connected to any place. There was no airport at all, let's say that. And after RCS, the Udan scheme came into play, we have constructed the airport. We have started with just giving two flights there. 
two flights per week we have started giving in Darbanga. This is four years back. And through successful operations of Udan scheme, now Darbanga is operating 70 flights per week. Look at how much growth demand we could create just by the Udan scheme. So Udan has been a great catalyst in kind of giving the uh, affordability of the fri uh, prices and also enhancing the connectivity to these remote regions. So which is why I say what, what else do you have from the government to ensure that these kind of things continue. We see that Udan has been a great success, eight years we have finished. We have envisioned that uh, Udan should be there for ten years. But after me assessing the situation for the last four months, I am with the uh, idea that we have to extend Udan for 10 more years. So we are, uh, as a government, we are going to come up with another plan where we extend the Udan scheme for 10 more years. Talking about your father who I interviewed and used to meet regularly when I used to be a cub reporter. Uh, he was a minister in the Deva Gauda and the Indra Kumar Gujral ministry in the center. Did you always want to be a politician? No, I never wanted to be a politician. I can say that I'm an accidental politician. It's a pun intended also. Uh, after my father met with an accident and his sudden demise, that was when I came into politics. I kind of took up the legacy that he has created. He has created so much, huge amount of goodwill amongst the Telugu uh, people and especially uh, in the Delhi circles and, uh, and through across parties and across regions. He has such great goodwill. And I felt as a youngster, as an educated person, I should take up that mantle and I should go forward. So it was an accidental decision that I made. But one thing I stuck on to was I wanted to continue the legacy that my father has built. And his whole principles has been, if I boil it down to two, it could be honesty and transparency. That is how he has worked overall through his career. And I felt if I had to continue that legacy, I have to hold on to those principles. And I kind of gave 100% to the decision that I took that I want to be into politics right now. And let it be me serving my people of Srikakulam as a member of parliament, or me serving my party, Telugu Desam party, or me serving the country uh, as an MP. So I've tried to give 100% always. And now in this new job of being a civil aviation minister, I'm committed to uh, give my 100%. You are the youngest member of the Modi cabinet. You're the baby of the team. Is it an advantage or a disadvantage? Youngest member today, I was, with personal curiosity, I was checking last 50 years, 75 years of independence, if there was anyone youngest. You should correct me or people from the audience also can correct me. I didn't find anyone younger. So you can say that I'm the youngest cabinet minister ever also. But that's just for the record's sake. But uh, I feel it is a advantage to a certain uh, point where there is a lot of uh, concentration on you. You get the kind of uh, uh, the limelight that you need to perform and there is a lot of enthusiasm around you when you say that you are the youngest minister. There is a lot of energy flowing into the system. When I went to the civil aviation ministry taking charge, everyone, the whole team in civil aviation ministry is was so charged up that we have a young minister here, we have to perform, we, they, he might be coming up with new ideas. So they were so accepting. And uh, they were also kind of adjusting to coming up with new ideas and all. So I found it to be an advantage to be a young minister. Uh, because when I was bringing out of the box ideas, they were willing to accept them. They, they, they felt that I was not carrying any baggage or I didn't have anything behind me, uh, which was leading to kind of making a certain decision. So that was one. And also uh, in the cabinet, I, I saw that uh, the advantage of being a young minister was that everyone was willing to guide and mentor me also. Even if I was with the idea that I didn't know how to maneuver a certain issue or uh, how do I deal with a certain issue. There were many people who wanted to guide me, who wanted to encourage me to take the right decision. So being a young member, I would say that overall it has been an advantage for me. Did you get any piece of advice from another charming, efficient minister, Jyoti Sindhya? Oh yeah, definitely. And uh, he was also super excited that there was someone younger coming in uh, after him to take charge of civil aviation ministry. And one thing he has advised was that he, he kind of gave a brief on what he has done while he was in charge of civil aviation. He wanted the, uh, the, the, the road to continue in that direction. So he gave a brief on how things were progressing, what the idea uh, of civil aviation or what the vision of uh, Honorable Prime Minister was. And he... Uh, kind of gave a brief on how he functioned while he was the minister. But one good advice that he has given was that he said don't stick with it. Okay. You bring what you want to bring to civil aviation. It is always what you believe or what you want to do with this. So entirely you are like the pilot now. I have taken it to a certain destination and I am giving you the coordinates on where you want to go. 
but how you want to go how you want to travel which way you want to do which plane you want to take this is all entirely your decision so that kind of freedom as a as a minister who has just uh, uh, finished his tenure and he's handing it over i think that was a great uh, idea to have that kind of freedom and not be uh, shackled with some kind of uh, restrictions i think that was a great piece of advice he gave me yeah that's a good advice uh, coming back to the state it is said that despite a strong case liquor case against jagan the naidu government is soft on him i don't probably think probably you feel that if you act he may generate some sympathy i don't think there is any soft coming time will t- time will answer this first of all i think we are very early into things right now and our responsibility right now let me get it cleared is that we have won with a huge majority something which i don't think any state government would have achieved uh, in the history of indian politics out of 175 assembly seats the nda government in the state has 164 so imagine the kind of expectations people have on you the responsibility people have given you so we want to give it is how you want to uh, uh, keep your priorities so our priority today is to get the progress and development of andhra pradesh back on track so all the ministers including the chief minister including our deputy chief minister even the prime minister we are kind of assessing the situation on how do we get things back on track how do we give back to the confidence that people have given to us in the in, in the mandate uh, through the elections so we are kind of uh, focusing more on the developmental activities and while law will take its own course all the cases which you are uh, kind of mentioning the investigation is going on it is not like see the government has changed and we want to go for political vendetta this is not the message that we want to give to the people we want we believe in constitution we believe in democratic principles so we will stick by it if we put a case or if we uh, follow up on a case uh, on anything it is going to be according to the law it is going to be according to the facts and evidence that we find so that clarity we want to maintain so we will take time when we address these issues you know after the tamil nadu chief minister mr stalin chandrababu naidu also has said that have more children see uh, there is first of all no controversy in uh, the point that chandrababu naidu saying that uh, we need more children uh, the families should have more children you should see that chandrababu naidu is a visionary when he talks about something he doesn't talk about it in terms of how do you win elections or what is going to happen in the next year or next two years he kind of thinks for the next 20 years 30 years and in fact 50 years also that has been his way of functioning and we have seen that also he doesn't need to prove himself in that and when he talks about this idea of having more children this comes with his uh, vision of seeing the developed countries like japan germany usa or nordic countries no matter which country you take in all of them are facing the problem of aging population which is uh, an advantage for india right now because we are the youngest nation in the entire glo- uh, world right now but how long will you have that if you look at the numbers south india especially the numbers of reproduction are very very uh, normal and now north you might have a little bit higher number but those also seem to be kind of decreasing yeah now you might come to a situation in the coming future maybe it might not be immediate future but maybe 20 years 30 years that we also face the problem of aging population so it is with that sense he wants to p- make the people aware that if you want india to still be an ad- advantageous country of demographic dividend over the next 30 years 50 years 100 years or 200 years our strongest advantage today should continue in the future also so he feels he needs to create more awareness around this idea he needs to propagate that idea he is not forcing people to do anything or this he just wants people to understand that india has an advantage over the entire world today because we are having a young population let that young population continue so is, that is the idea he has is there a suggestion that people who have three children only they will be allowed to contest the local body no, elections no no i think if he, it's it's a very i mean just propagating idea he would have jokingly said that but it's not nothing like that yeah <laughs> just to give you the figures you know the replacement level to keep the population as it is is 2.1 whereas in andhra pradesh telangana is 1.8 yeah. 
yeah, yeah. So actually the population at this rate will exactly. go down and there would be more old people. Exactly. So, so that's what… He, he, in terms of a vision, he feels that India should be always the leading country in the world. So we need young population for that. For the example, you can take other countries also which are facing the aging population. So it's as simple as that. Yeah. India should have young population. For that, we need to have more uh, children. Yeah. Thank you.